Thank you very much. It's great to see so many people in our hometown. It's great to see so many people from coming all over the world. My name is Wolfgang Stelzle. I'm CEO and founder of Reflect. And what we aim for is making maintaining and operating complex machinery as easy as using a simple kitchen appliance. And in this talk, I want to talk you through where we are with this. And I also want to show you a little bit and talk you a little bit through our history. And for that, um, I've asked our partner, our close partner and investor, Bosch, to come with me on stage. Um, and therefore, I want to ask Jürgen Lumera, product director uh, from Bosch on stage. Hello, Jürgen. Hi. Thanks. Introduce yourself a bit. Okay, um, my name is Jürgen Lumera. I'm in charge at Bosch for augmented reality when you use it for training, service information, and I be I'm a believer in AR since five years. And that's how we met. You've probably seen him. Okay. <laughs> Okay, do you remember how this began years ago? I, I, I do remember this, um, and it, is, it, it was actually in 2012, and I think it was even earlier, 2011 or something. Um, so that's how we started. We started with a piece of paper, and we augmented a car on top of it, and we made that car interactive. In 2012, um, we had to use like 2,000, 3,000 polygons to do that, and it was a very shaky experience. Um, but we were believing in the concept of AR, and we, starting from this stage, we continued developing more and more of such use cases. And a couple of we want to show over the next slides. And the first one, Jürgen, you probably remember this. Uh, of course I do. Help, help me remember as well. So we had a, to solve a problem with a very specific um, ceiling. So we said, okay, could we not test augmented reality by applying it to solve a real problem? And, and you will see through all of our examples, we want to solve a real problem. We're not doing this because AR is AR. If it doesn't help the service technician or anybody using AR, we won't do it. And in this case, we wanted to superimpose a um, description how to install a fuel return line. And we want to do this for multiple technicians which had a problem by killing the ceiling at the moment when they did it. And to get even to that point, we were using the previous um, paper version and showed, hey, this is what you could do with AR. Now imagine how it would look like in an engine compartment. And this is the first thing we built successfully and, and very well appreciated by the customers and the technicians. And after that, we developed a use case for this nice little dashboard. What was that about? Okay, and then, of course, the, the, the first one was a mechanical installation. Well, what is much more important for a service technician is the ability to locate components inside of a vehicle. And why is this? This is because I have wire harnesses running completely through a vehicle, and the more components you add to it, the less it's possible to identify where those components are. And this here is an application where we have tried very early to train service technician by showing them how the wire harness routes through the vehicle, where the new components are, how can I get access to it. And even in, in this um, example, it was the case that when you execute a training, you may don't have the car you need to train on. So adding components the car physically doesn't have helped them a lot. And this was five years ago. So we moved into training with the need to simplify the way a mechanic finds components in the vehicle and remembers where they are. And you connected that to diagnostic systems as well, right? Yeah, of course. When, when the very first one was a mechanical engineering or mechanical um, service technician, then we had diagnostic training, component location, and now we want to do something for the service advisor because I can also use this for interacting with the customer. And what you see here is we're superimposing the test result at the moment the car arrives in the workshop. So it's really getting dynamic data and simplify the communication with the customer. And I think that's we already now identified all the areas where it significantly can help showing complex cases, routing harnesses through um, a vehicle, mechanical repair, 
electrical repair and customer interaction to make it much more transparent what is currently happening with my car, why I'm doing this or that. And what did we learn from that, Wolfgang? Well, thinking back, um, we started work very early on. Um, we, we founded the company in 2012, and I worked in a digital agency two and a half years before. My partner worked for Metayu by the time he led their sales department. And yeah, we're almost working since a decade in the area. And, and um, really, my experience is, um, at least since, let's say, two, three years ago, was for such use cases, for the use cases we have, uh, we've shown on, on the slides, for us as a technology company, there were three major hurdles. The first one was the technology on the software and on the hardware side just wasn't mature enough. Yeah, looking back to 2012, especially tracking technologies weren't mature enough to capture real-world objects in a very robust and accurate way. Also, hardware like phones and tablets, especially air glasses, um, they didn't have the performance to render the content correctly, to track the content, and that's making it very hard for enterprises to feed in content. Second is, we talked a lot about technology, and we made that mistake as well. A couple of years ago, we were talking about technology, 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 and we most often forgot the real problem, the real problem in the enterprises, um, and then the solution to it, and, and maybe, AR is not a solution to the problem. And that's also something we learned a lot. And last but not least, it wasn't possible to scale. Like when we identified a use case which did work out, which the feedback was very positive, which we validated an ROI, as Jürgen just explained in the use case, we couldn't really make that happen for the whole vehicle range in 27 languages and for different use cases. And that's why we decided to develop a product together to make that possible. And we started as a, yeah, let's say, customer vendor relationship in the early days in 2012. But ever since 2014, we um, have a very strong partnership with Bosch. And I want to ask Jürgen, Jürgen, why the heck um, did you as Bosch decide to work with us, to partner with us? I it's the awareness where your strengths are. And, and we know very precisely how to deliver information to service technician, how to repair a car, how you create technical documentation. I'm coming from an area inside of Bosch where we have 800 technical authors creating content, wiring diagrams, service information labor types. So we had a good idea what a technician needs, how we can transport it to the technician, how we can efficiently create, that's what Wolfgang said, multiple languages, localization, address all of the needs you have when you're not just doing a simple project for a fridge or whatever. We do it, we want to do it for everything we are doing. So, and therefore, we look for a partner who can complement the missing experience we had at that time with augmented reality. And this was obvious, a company here in Munich where we have a close relation uh, due to all the other um, manual projects we did, but we're trustful and know that they can do to add the part of AR to our knowledge of how to create technical documentation. But what did we actually develop? We developed together a framework which allows to reduce significantly the effort to create content. But I think that's not all. We moved the people doing it away from software developers to technical authors, to trainers, to salespeople who want to collect information, marketing departments, but always with the intention of scalability. This system was built to make all of the variants of a certain vehicle available in AR. With all the variants you find, there, no vehicle looks like the other when you buy one. Everybody has customizations. And AR needed to be so flexible and creatable that we can show a service technician the car in front of him, exactly that. So the concept was not to develop a what you see is what you get editor, so to say, for augmented reality, but rather a system which integrates seamlessly into technical information systems, right? Yeah. For, we, we applied that um, 
sinking of technical information, and therefore we had to embed in such system, managing metadata, managing variant ma variants of it, managing languages and publication. Just that you get an idea when you remember the first example we showed after the paper version was a fuel return line. And we thought, oh, last year, when we have now our whole system at the uh, version two, shall we not try to rebuild what we had built years ago? And it took us 20 man days years ago with software developers to get the tracking right, to get all of the CAT data conformed. And with this system, and also did it in four hours, including the tracking, everything. So it shows no software developer needed. It doesn't take so long anymore to do it. And also did it correct. We actually found a problem in the original thing that it was technically not correct done. So, and was a, a master technician. He is an author. He kept the CAT data created a tracking configuration and published it out in four hours compared to 20 man days of software development five years ago. And we were using that platform also to create this use case. And this, this is a use case you've probably seen. It's not the typical use case for maintenance and operation. Um, what, it, what it does, it visualizes a fireman um, where the components in a car are which are dangerous and which he should not cut in the event of an accident, for example. So we were using uh, augmented reality to make that way more efficient. And this is completely done by a technical author rather than a um, software developer, as you said. Um, although it's not, not the use case you as Bosch is prob are probably primarily targeting in the service area, um, why, is this, why is this use case being rolled out, I think, one and a half years ago so important for you, though? When it, technically, it, it's not something we would ship into a workshop, but it has all the component a service technician is interested in. So we developed this together with Mercedes, with their first responder team internally, and they were at the beginning, oh, 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 AR, we have somebody having an accident, and, and now you want to come and, and do AR. And then we showed them what is possible, and how you can do it. And suddenly, they were totally bought in. We haven't done what we originally had intended to do. We did it a little different, but they gave their input. And suddenly, we had a system which helps a first responder in the same way as a technician. We show them where the components are, which are dangerous for them. So if I'm ar arriving at an accident scene, I need to know where are my high voltage wires. I need to know where are the untriggered airbags, because if I cut into the car, and this is the only reason why they would need information like that, I need to open the car, because the person cannot open the door by itself. It has to be deformed. So he needs to know where all the locations are. And this is the same problem as I described before, component location for technical components for batteries, et cetera. That's why, why it was so important for us to make this first step and roll it out globally. This is done for 55 plus vehicles for Mercedes. You all can download this app. If you have a Mercedes, you open the tank flap, you get a barcode and can download it. You see how AR works on your car. And this is the second large part which we, we really had hoped for, getting a global rollout, which we think right now is the largest rollout of an AR app, which has a real benefit, is not marketing, as a benefit, it saves life. It goes to the Bosch uh, idea, invented for life, we save life with this. And, and therefore, it fits perfect in our strategy, and we learned a lot. And to do the next step then, um, we we were raising money in 2015, 2016, and um, obviously um, Bosch uh, invested in, in Reflect. Um, so again, the, my question, why, why, why did you do that? Are you were so handsome guys. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was talking about the guy on the other side. Not yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, what I think at that time, a lot of acquisitions took place. Apple bought Metaio. PTC invested significantly. Um, we were, we've seen other um, major investments, um, venture capital, and we thought, okay, we think we have something. We've proven it with Daimler that our generic idea works. We have a service information concept, uh, um, technical documentation concept, moved to AR, and now we want to secure beyond the partnership. We wanted to own a part of a company which worked very well together with us, and we see a future in it. So we secured this, and, and we wanted to grow together to a much larger 
a company with respect to AR, but Bosch is pretty large, but the AR part should grow very large, and we could benefit from each other. And we did this. A startup with an established company worked perfect together, and we were successful in both areas. I like the idea of Reflect growing to the size of Bosch, actually. <laughs> Um, so we do a quick, a quick jump uh, one, one and a half, two years later. And um, there's going to be a talk straight after this talk if you're interested in, um, in a really large rollout. So we're really going out from the proof of concept from the pilot phase now. And Bosch develops a training solution on top of the core to roll it out globally. Jürgen, my question to you now is, you're working for so long in the area in augmented reality, and as you said, you're a big fan of it. Um, why, why did it take Bosch, I'm not saying Jürgen, but why did it take Bosch so long to, to roll out augmented reality if, if you have such a good product? But one Jürgen and Bosch is not enough. This is the easy answer. But the other thing is, it's the same way as with any customer. We're selling this technology to our customers, to the OEM, to pretty much any industries, and we're selling it internally. But our own customers are as critical as the others. Show me a return of investment. And with training, we could show this. This was the first one where our training centers, and we have a large amount of training centers, where we can apply efficient training to our service technician for new technologies like hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles, um, um, uh, hydrogen, uh, adaptive driver systems. There are a lot of technologies out in the car which you cannot explain with a traditional training approach. And suddenly, our training departments, which I tried to convince since years, bought in. This was a no-brainer for them. We want to train our service technician in these new technologies, and we're using a new technology for it. So this is also, we roll this out, so we're not convincing somebody else by saying, hey, this is a good technology. We show that we believe inside of Bosch that our training centers will benefit from that, and we roll this out in Europe. You will hear in the next talk our trainers, and listen to them, the trainers telling you how they did and why they did, and why we're rolling it out and what we will gain from it, as Bosch and, of course, also our customers. So I'm pretty excited about the next talk. But before we show all the exciting stuff, I want to ask the question back to you, Jürgen. Um, out of all the experiences, proof of concept, pilot projects, rollouts, what were, in your opinion, the key hurdles um, to take for you in the last couple of years? And what may be the key hurdles for a lot of people here in the audience thinking about the same processes? I think the very first thing is, you have a new technology and you have a certain arrogance. You go somewhere and tell, we know what you need. And technically, very often, we didn't listen carefully enough. So we misunderstood the real problem and therefore didn't solve their problem. I think we learned this. We learned this with our ex internal and external companies. We go much closer to their problem and try to address it. Um, the other thing, at the companies where we're dealing with, internal or external departments, they were overconfident in the ability of their own team to do this. So they didn't realize that they may need different type of personality to go to a new technology like that. Um, we generated, together with the customer or with others, fails expectation. We promised too much at the beginning. AR was not as fast we all had hoped. AR was not as stable as we hoped. Now it is. Now this year is, is totally different than, than last year and the year before, and it's, it's exponentially getting better. So now it's much easier to promise them things we can keep, but years before it was a problem. Then when you do a POC, and this is, I think, all over, independent what company is doing it, the POC is very oversimplified because somebody wants to prove something. We do AR, and therefore we build the POC. But what you do is you just show, hey, I had an innovation, I did something, but you didn't think about what does it need from the POC to roll out, and then it's wasted time and money. If a POC is not tailored to a rollout and self or, 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 or fulfills KPIs, which are defined up front, wasted money. Nobody considered a complete roadmap. This is um, actually the follow-up of the POC case. I have to think what money do I have invest afterwards. 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 euro for POC is not everything. If I have a global organization, I have spent a significant amount of money. If you're not willing to do this, to think at least up front, why would you invest in a POC? 
you have to have the viewpoint from the beginning. And then, of course, and this is, I'm sure a lot of, at least the suppliers know this, lack of trust in new technologies because we were not always, we as technology provider globally, fulfilling the promises. So we lost a lot of trust, and now we had to gain this in AR, that AR is different. AR can keep these promises in the future. And I'm confident it is doing it right now. Look in the exhibition, and you see many, many very good solutions already who kept that promise. I, I, guess, I guess this is something uh, which probably happens to every new technology, right? You, you overpromise, um, and then you burn your fingers with that, and then you try not touching the technology for a long time. But on the other hand, um, I, I would always also recommend like having the American attitude, basically, especially to us Germans, uh, fail, uh, uh, go, go fast, fail fast, and stand up again. Because otherwise, how would you learn what's, what's adding value, um, where the next technology can be applied, and so on and so forth. So I really think it is necessary to also sometimes fail and then to acknowledge that and, and, and plan for the next step. So um, we really hope that this talk um, gave a good insight on, on what our experiences were in the past and up to date. And you will see, what you will see more from us is um, that, that Bosch is developing a lot more solutions. So on the training perspective, that's uh, the first uh, solution which is being used internally but also applied externally. You're going to see diagnostic solutions probably. So a lot more solutions really, you don't need to think about the technology anymore, but you can just benefit from the value that the technology brings. And from us as Reflect, we're going to enhance the ecosystem. We're going to onboard um, new partners in the authoring area, for example, new solution partners, system integrators. So really that this ecosystem is going to grow um, and, and everyone out there in the industry can benefit from, uh, from what we do together here. So Jürgen, I really want to thank um, that you came on stage with me. Um, it was really good talking with you. It actually the first time that we did that uh, together on stage. We thought this is a good opportunity here in Munich. Um, and if, if you want to come to us at the booth, to Bosch at the booth, you can see all of what we just told you um, live in real time. You can talk to Jürgen, you can talk to myself. Actually, you can't talk to Jürgen because he's hosting the Enterprise Track to today afternoon. <laughs> And we're going to uh, host the enterprise track tomorrow. So I hope uh, that, you, that you all have a very good uh, couple of days and couple of hours. Just one last thing um, as a little advertisement. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I have the honor to, to chair a, um, a, a federal work group for startups in the Economic Council Germany. Um, so together with the German government, we're improving the German ecosystem. That should be especially interesting for all the German founders, for all the German venture capitalists in the group here, and for all the German industry companies. Come to me um, if you, if you want to help work, work in that group, if you want to improve the startup ecosystem, and if you want to know how we can leverage the strength we have with German industry companies like Bosch, because that is an asset we have globally. How can we leverage that with startups? And I do think, and, and uh, I, I know that Jürgen does it as well, I do think that uh, also Bosch um, uh, is believing in the partnerships with uh, startups. So we need, we need to enforce that here in Germany. With that, I want to thank you, everyone, for listening. And now we're ready for questions. Yeah. Exactly. As you can tell, oh, we have so many screens. So Twice many the screens. <laughs> Twice the amount. So are you ready just to answer those? We are ready to answer those. And we start from the top, Jürgen. That's probably the perfect <laughs> question for you, right? I guess it refers to Mercedes rescue cars. How does it work if a car has crashed? I, I, I got this question so often. <laughs> I, I thought, the answer is, if it totally crashed, it will not track. Done. But this is also maybe not the time where you actually may, would need. You need to act much faster. So um, typically, this is when it's deformed, you always have one part of the car which you can start and tracking, and this works very good, or you move the object into the space. Um, but it, it's really the, the first responders are happy with the limitation because it's not just it would not, not track when it's crashed, when it's heavily raining or really dark and they don't set up, it would also not work. 
but it's, it gives them enough information when they're coming and they could start moving there that they have more confidence than before and they get the information much more condensed. Following up to that, and oh, has it disappeared? How? Oh yeah, it's it goes. It how goes has the back. car tracked? Maybe maybe just to that because it's the follow up on, on the question from Jurgen. Um, we use a technology which is called model based tracking. So out of the CAD model of the car, out of the 3D model, we derive that tracking configuration. And because the 3D content is coming out of the same CAD system, then the actual tracking, the coordinate systems match. Yeah. So that's how it's working from the algorithm side. How to persuade so those stakeholders who are not keen with new technologies? You can you probably know better from Bosch, okay, right? The only way is to show him or her or the team that this is a benefit. It makes something easier. It doesn't add additional hurdles. Because the typical thing, they say, oh, this is cat data. It's too much data. I don't have the cat data. It's, I transfer too much. You need to convince him from the beginning that Forget the technology, look at your turn investment. What can I reach if I would eliminate this and this and this? What can I reach if I would give somebody information he never had before? And, and this is the entrance point. If you come from technology and would argue AR is cool, typically this is a dead end. I would totally agree to that. It's, about, it's not about the technology, it's about the value propositions. That's what we said in the talk. One mistake we made, we talked too much about technology. We need to talk more about the actual problem again. <laughs> what do developers instead? <laughs> it's probably a question I can answer. Uh, well, they drink coffee, uh, eat cake. Um, no, of course, I mean, there's still a lot to do. Um, you will see that when you go to the exhibition um, on, on which stage augmented reality is, and there's a lot of use cases which per work perfectly fine and which can be rolled out globally, but there's also use cases which, does, which do not work yet, um, which need, for example, hands-free work, the glasses need to improve, the use cases need to be more intelligent in the future, being presented to the user without the user, asking what do I have to do or choosing the scenario. So there's still a lot to do for software developers. It's not only about the content authoring, and we're sure we're going to employ a lot more software developers in the future. <laughs> Is actually the, the, start, the start one, which disappeared immediately, no gone. OK, which use case is generating the most financial traction, which is, of course, like most of the time the most important question, I guess. How much is it going to cost me? Well, I, from the Reflect side, um, have, have two answers to that. And Jürgen, you may want to add to that. Um, what, what we see a lot right now is using augmented reality, meaning real 3D content superimposed on top of real-world objects in the training area. Um, and on the other hand, there's a use case which, which, which we see a lot with a product Reflect Remote, um, which is remote assistance, remote expert. You're also going to see that a lot on the exhibition. So that's use cases which are being actively requested by customers already because they work. And I'm sure there's a lot more. I think it's, you cannot say this is this use case and it generates a lot of traction. It's different per company. Important is, it solves a problem where you can save money or be fast, etc. This is generating traction. I would say when you look around the exhibition, it's training right now. But this is the one we can exhibit all together, all, all the suppliers the best. But what it really is, what is for an individual company, the best trans also financial impact depends on the company. For certain, it's component location. For other, it's maybe sales interaction. And the third one, production improvement. This is not a generic answer to that. It depends on the industry and actually on, on the customer. We're going to go for the next one. Is the model tracking based on a third party technology or developed in house? As a well, our, our I'm eating cake with someone else and drinking coffee. I think that's the question. That, that, that's the question. Mm -hmm. um, our, our platform approach is we want to deliver best of breed to our customers. The customers really should not care about which tracking technology is being used, which diagnostic system is being plugged onto, um, what, what, what's the IoT data, how is it getting, getting in. So we're using best of breed technology. And that means uh, concretely with uh, uh, technologies like tracking, we also partner. Um, in, that, in that regard, we partner with Fraunhofer and uh, with a company called Visometry. Um, but also, we are very modular in that regard. So meaning, um, if we don't need model-based tracking, there's technologies like ARKit and ARCore. Um, the technologies are getting more and more commodity. 
And we want to integrate those technologies to make the best for our customers. That's really what, we, what our approach is. Okay. As we're kind of like running out of time, I would just suggest like going for the last three questions. And there's a, like a real life situation set because like all of the, the things that you just saw were like perfect lightning in a garage. But how well does it work in various light conditions? For example, does it work on a lit street at night? Uh, it doesn't work at night. It may work on a lit street at night. Um, the thing is, it's getting better and better. And in the meantime, we can say for some objects, um, and cars belong to that, um, it's working really, really robust right now. Um, there's other objects which, for example, don't have large contrasts, like a white plain table. There, of course, tracking technologies still have problems. But in a lot of cases, it works perfectly fine. I, I would like to add something to this, because I know a story. And uh, the, the ones in you who present from time to time products and, and have from the start used tracking technology where they say, okay, you need to have uh, the product in a certain color, this is track best. And we ordered last year a white car. Our marketing department ordered it because they knew we need white cars. And what came was a black car, very dark as, as you can get. And we had neon lights at the ceiling. And I said, oh, this will never ever track. We went out and it tracked. So the algorithm has so much improved that I don't have to care anymore if it's a black car and if neon light on the ceiling. It tracks. It's not mixing up the reflection of the neon light with the rim of the car. It works. It will most likely not work on a very dark night and a dark vehicle, unlikely. It, but maybe then you don't need augmentation. You should have flashlights with you or so, something like that. But we, it's tremendously improved. Pick two out of the, la the remaining three. Two? Uh, well, we can also make it short and, and say, come, come to our booth, and then we can show you how That's it That's what I wanted to offer anyway, but as we're here on stage, <laughs> so, uh, uh, show, I show, to give you the show it how it works. Well, how do we get the CAD data into the system? As explained before, we didn't talk about the architecture of the platform, but the, the platform really integrates into existing technical authoring system and integrates into existing CAD systems. So we, we make sure that out of those systems, the data can be published into augmented reality. So you don't have an additional CAD authoring tool or something. We really make use of those systems. The advantage is that you can continue using what you're using in the enterprise. You can reuse your content. And probably most important, your staff doesn't need to learn how a new augmented reality system is working. Um, he or she can just continue using the tools she's already used to. All right, and as you can tell, like the screen disappeared. We are running out of time. Uh, but again, if you have further questions, of course, like with Slido, it's going to be possible just to also answer like um, online. But again, uh, the both of you will be there at the booth. So for any further questions, yeah. you're ready to answer them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jürgen and Wolfgang. Yeah.